This episode is sponsored by Audible. Get a free audiobook of your choice that you get to keep with their free trial. You can learn more at lutherancartographer.com slash audible. The Lutheran Cartographer, episode 67. Welcome to The Lutheran Cartographer, the podcast where we explore what it's like to be Lutheran in different places. I'm your host, Nicholas Weber. Today we are going to Sharon, Pennsylvania to talk to Pastor Jacob Deal. He is the pastor of Saints Peter and Paul Evangelical Lutheran Church. Pastor Deal, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Nicholas. Help orient us geographically. We're in Pennsylvania. Where in Pennsylvania is Sharon? So Sharon, Pennsylvania, it's right on the Ohio-Pennsylvania line. It's right kind of on a diagonal. If you were to put a pin in Cleveland and put a pin in Pittsburgh, like right in the middle of those two, uh, you'll find Sharon, right off of I-80. All right. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you came to Sharon. Well, uh, this is my first call right out of seminary. I went to Fort Wayne uh, Theological Seminary, and my family and I moved here all the way actually from Sacramento, California. That was our last place um, that we were. We had a delayed vicarage out at um, Light of the Hills Lutheran Church in Cameron Park, California. Um, but before that, obviously, was in Fort Wayne, Indiana. But I spent most of my life, actually like 20 years of my life, growing up in Luna Pier, Michigan, which is right on the uh, Ohio-Michigan line north of Toledo, Ohio. So I grew up on the lake listening to the waves and watching the sunrise in the morning. Fantastic. That sounds great. So I'm a little puzzled about where exactly you draw the line in terms of like where the Midwest is and where it isn't. Uh, where would Does Pennsylvania have a kind of a similar culture to Michigan or is it noticeably different? I think it's noticeably different. Um, I think in Michigan, a lot of the times, you know, I thought there was more of community, you know, getting together and doing things. Uh, In Pennsylvania, I mean, I considered myself growing up in the Midwest, I'll say that much, Uh, might be up for debate among some, but uh, in Pennsylvania, they definitely do not, uh, they don't consider themselves obviously that Midwest kind of, uh, they're more East Coast. I think the people are more reserved. Uh, I think that's a good way to say it. You know, they're just a reserved bunch of people that uh, they like their, their property, their own homes, and um, not all the time do they get out uh, to, you know, or even let you in. I mean, that's like one of the differences here. The going and visiting people in their homes is a, a very much a challenge. I see. Would you say that some of that insularity is towards just outsiders or do you think it's towards other people, towards their own people as well? I think it's it's I think it's all around. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's just outsiders. Now I know my I'm I'm very fortunate. Uh, the house that I live in is uh, surrounded by some great neighbors. So you know we throw fires in the summer pretty much every night. Uh, <laughs> it seems like one of us uh, will have a fire going and we all go over and sit around and talk. Uh, but that took I want to say probably about two years before that even happened. So um, that might have been more or less with your with your neighbors, but the people are still friendly. Um, but it's it's just a different challenge to come in and visit as a pastor. I think that's maybe one of the one of the things. I see. That makes sense. Let's go on and talk about what are some of the best things about the area. One of the best things about the area is it is affordable. We live in a very low income area. Uh, so we have housing in Sharon, Pennsylvania. Anyway, we have housing for about 28,000 people or at least somewhere about there because we were, you know, more or less in the area where the, the booming steel industry was happening. We had a whole bunch of plants here there. Um, not all of them are open anymore, but we had a lot of housing for, for people. Um, and now our population is probably right around 15 or so thousand. So you can pick up a, a livable house, uh, might require some work, but a livable house for about $30,000, which to probably many of your listeners are like, that's, you know, that's the cost of a brand new car. That's it. You know, that's not a big deal. Um, but the, you know, that's, that's one of the nice things we have a community of about five cities um, that are all kind of interlocking. 
they ended up splitting up sometime in the past. And so we have Sharon, Farrell, Hermitage, uh, Sharpsville, uh, West Middlesex. And those communities are all, you know, you don't even know really where the dividing line is sometimes. So it's kind of neat. You get to go into different communities. All of them have their kind of own identity. Um, and they will definitely confirm that for you. <laughs> they all consider themselves uh, independent of the other. Uh, but it's neat to, you know, kind of be uh, in one place. Like Sharon has a very quaint downtown, um, but then you go to Hermitage and it's it's more of a larger city where there's not so much that downtown area. Uh, also, you know, right off of I-80, we're easy to travel. So it's not uncommon for us to just get on the, the turnpike and head um, to anywhere where really that we want to go. And we're also right near state parks. Lots of things to do, leisure activities. You can go fishing, biking. Uh, my kids love to fish, and also we have we have some like major events that our that our city throws. Uh, one of them's called Water Fire, but kind of a neat thing on the river that they do. The last thing I think that was maybe like a really really cool thing that we we didn't realize was how many ethnic groups are in the area. So our church is Slovak uh, of, in heritage. I mean, it's a hundred-year-old congregation. So we're mostly made up of Slovaks. Uh, there's some Germans in there. But we also have Italians. There's Irish. One of my friends uh, owns the Haitian restaurant in town. He's actually from Haiti. Um, then you have, like, Croatians, um, the Amish. I mean, the, the whole area is very diverse. Some of the best Italian pizza I've ever had. That sounds great. What are some of the challenges about being in the area? Even though the area has a ton of houses uh, for relatively cheap, one of the biggest issues that we have is it's an economically depressed area, severely. And that tends to lead to a lot of crime, uh, as well as uh, dilapidated infrastructure, you know, houses that are pretty much boarded up. There's a street couple down from the church that's just pretty much entirely empty homes uh, we've done canvassing in the neighborhood for certain events and i just i remember knocking on a door to a lady's house and i said hey would any of your other neighbors like to have this information and she said well we don't really have any other neighbors on this street um, they're they're all gone and you know it's hard to afford in some ways for some families uh, there's a lot of living off of welfare uh, even the families that want to get off of welfare would be uh, have a hard time doing so because of the job market in the area so uh, we've had i remember having a, a family move from another part in pa and upon moving here it was they couldn't they couldn't find a job in what they wanted to do so you know they ended up moving away again uh, we also have a challenge with drug use. Uh, we get a lot of those from Youngstown, Ohio, that have, you know, kind of trying to leave the city and then end up coming over to this area. Um, so we've had we've had a lot of issues with drugs, um, and then also uh, robbery. My own house has been robbed, uh, broken into. Uh, we have a lack of public transportation. And then, you know, the people that do want to walk places even to get to work, sometimes it's hard because our sidewalks, we don't even have sidewalks in every place uh, to be able to walk to those. So that's that's tough. I mean, and there's a lot of transient people, you know, in and out. Sometimes they take up residence in the uh, abandoned homes. So, I mean, you put all those things together and you really have a, a challenging area to to navigate. Yeah. How do you begin to go about navigating those challenges? Well, as a pastor, I know the needs are there. My secretary, Diane, uh, just become an incredible uh, friend uh, to the family, as well as a person that has known the area, been able to help me out. But I remember when I was first there, she drove me around, showed me all around Sharon and said, oh, you know, this place used to be open. Um, this place used to be, you know, a steel mill. This place used to be a coating facility. And it was kind of seen time and time again how there was nothing there. And I looked at I looked at her, and she still remembers this to the day. She said, um, what, what I said was that 
this place looks like it has a lot of opportunity. Uh, and I see that the same thing with the, with the people. When you're at rock bottom, uh, your theology as a Lutheran really comes into play uh, to teach that everything is a gift. It doesn't matter how much you make. It doesn't matter um, your horrible past, however um, haunting it might be. Uh, those things aren't prerequisites, you know, and you have to have your whole life together before you come into the church. And that's been a big uh, part of my ministry here, as well as the congregation uh, with talking with people and inviting them in to, you know, say, we don't want you for your money. We don't want you for your tithes. We want you because Jesus loves you. Uh, Jesus died for you. Jesus forgave all your sins. And so we we bring you in as a, a lost and condemned sinner, just like the rest of us. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go on and talk about what it's like to be a Lutheran there. You've mentioned how the Lutheran theology really speaks to this really difficult position that your community is in. Are Lutherans well known? Um, what's Is there a Christian ethos in the town? What's it like to be Lutheran there? I'd say that's like another one of the challenges to the area. So our those five city kind of that I was talking about earlier, they were always known as having a bar and a church on every corner and sometimes multiples of each. And that is the running joke in the area. Now, what you find is that most of the bars are still open, but the churches are closed. And the churches that are here, we have a lot of Presbyterians, um, PCUSA, EPC, um, and those, you know, those two are very prominent. Um, we also used to have a lot of Roman Catholic parishes, but they have been consolidating. So they're they're closing down, you know, some of these congregations that have been long standing in the area, um, people members there for their whole life. Um, that's another part of this this community is when the people moved here. Um, remember, their parents would have been the ones that you know put all the time and money into these properties when it was a very nice area. Um, but now as it's declined, they're not sure what to do with the property. I, as I talk with people. Um, so I go to one of the local bars um, from time to time and sit down and talk with the people there and I'll share a beer and, and talk and such. And what I've come to ask is, what do you, you know, what do you tell your kids or what did you tell your kids about the area? And what they, what they tell me is that they told their kids not to stay, just get out of here, go to any other place, but just don't come here. Uh, there's no jobs, the the violence, um, and some of the other uh, negatives that have been impacting this area. Now, that's not all the time, but it is a it is a reality that I have to deal with that young families in this area aren't necessarily uh, in abundance. Uh, there are there are some there, but a lot of them are already established in another church, whether it's Presbyterian, uh, Roman Catholic, we have a lot of Orthodox churches, as well as your normal um, non-denominational uh, Baptist, Methodist, basically any flavor that you want, which makes it very hard because there's a lot of people that are like, well, I don't like this about this, or I don't like this about that. And so they go to a different church. Um, we have about two uh, three ELCA churches within a few miles of our church. So the LCMS is very much a minority. Um, the closest LCMS church is 30 minutes to the south. Um, then we have another one about 40 minutes to the um, southeast, and then obviously into Youngstown, Ohio, so about another 30 minutes to the other direction. But we're the only one here uh, in Sharon in that surrounding area. I see. Pastor Deal, you mentioned that one of the things is that Lutherans aren't as well known there. How have you gone about reaching out to your community? Yeah, that is a great question. So within our church, we knew that um, when I was there, it was hard, uh, you know, going up and down the street asking people, do you know Saints Peter and Paul Lutheran Church? Our church is right on a main road, very busy, uh, very visible, but nobody really knew where it was. Uh, so one of the things that we did, uh, we never called it evangelism because it, we weren't really 
bringing them in for a Bible study or a sermon or anything, but we, we started having annual community days. This will be our fourth annual one, I believe, or fifth annual one. And what it is, is it's a completely free event. We recognize that our community, being as impoverished as they are, sometimes kids are taking care of themselves. Uh, their parents don't have money, uh, or at least don't give them the money to spend on certain carnivals or activities. So we reached out to local businesses. We were able to gather enough support that we were able to offer free raffle baskets, um, also games for kids, crafts, um, tournaments, little things like that. They all had prizes. They always left with something, and then we always provided a meal. Uh, that changed this last year. We kind of during the midst of the pandemic, we, we kind of changed things up, but we still had one. We threw a movie night uh, just with all the racial tension at the time. I remember it was in October. We um, purchased the stuff to throw a movie night with, you know, licensing for the movie. We licensed uh, Remember the Titans and we showed it on a 25 foot screen. It was huge and a uh, blast in the parking lot. You know, we didn't have as many people because it was, you know, a little bit cold that night, but you know, anywhere between 70 and a hundred or so people show up to these events every year. And that's been a great time to just, I would put it this way, to earn the respect of the community, uh, to have a place in this community as a safe place for kids to go and hang around um, and not have to worry about anything. So, I remember last year, kids uh, called up their parents and said, "Hey, mom, dad, I'm at uh, I'm at that church on the corner, Saints Peter and Paul." You know, and the parents had no problem with that. Um, that's been you know three or four years in the making now. So, we may not be bringing members in that way, but that's not what it was for. Uh, those events are strictly to be able to have the opportunity to have a meet and greet, a first time encounter with some of the folks in our area, especially considering how transient this place is. So that's been a very good thing. Um, it's also helped our property stay clean um, as well because people do respect our area. That's really good. Let's take a moment for a word from our sponsor. Folks, if you like podcasts, you will enjoy Audible. It's a service that gives you a audiobook to listen to each month of your choice from a large library. And they want to get you started with a free trial offer that includes an audiobook that you get to keep. So go to lutherancartographer.com slash audible to get your free audiobook and start your free trial today. If you're not sure what book to check out, I recommend taking a look at Pastor Jonathan Fisk's Broken, Seven Christian Rules That Every Christian Should Break As Often As Possible. This was recently released on Audible. I'm very excited about it. In the book, Pastor Fisk goes through the classic pitfalls of moralism, mysticism, and rationalism, as well as several others. Check it out at lutherancartographer.com slash audible. Let's get back to our guest. Let's talk now about what it's like to raise a family there. You've already mentioned the the challenges. How does and that there aren't many young families. How do you and how do the people that are raising family children begin to deal with the area or navigate it successfully? Well, one of the things that becomes incredibly important uh something that I teach a lot in the church too. Uh, comes time and time again is the the doctrine of the three estates and the importance of um, the home and as God gave and made things in creation and kind of you know he did write these things into creation for us and as I talked about how the community uh, is breaking down that's by and large a breakdown of the family uh, because we have so many parents who were either absent. Uh, or currently are absent, you know, the unwanted pregnancies or unexpected, unplanned, all of those sorts of things have contributed to the place where we are right now. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think the the shutting down of the plants and the uh, transformation of that uh, really had a major impact on our society right here in Sharon. But um, really the breakdown of the family 
uh, has contributed majorly to that. So when we're raising our kids here, we have to really focus on our own family. So we, we are working on, you know, keeping everything in Christ. And because our kids, you know, have the trauma of having a break in, in our home within the first, I think year or two years that I was here. And then, you know, hearing about shootings and other things like that. I mean, it's kind of like I was telling you earlier uh, that it's hard when you become inoculated to that kind of violence where you're just like, oh, you know, that's just another day. Uh, but for our kids, you know, they're like, why, why are people doing that? And so handling those sorts of questions and, you know, why can't they play out in the front yard? Uh, why do they only play in the backyard? You know, those sorts of things. I mean, we have uh, uh, some issues within our, within our community that make us want to keep our children secure as much as we can. Uh, now, again, it's not like that all the time. Uh, my kids op obviously play in the front yard. Um, my neighbors are wonderful. Um, they, they all watch our kids to make sure that, you know, nobody's there, but it's always in the back of our minds. So we're always explaining to our children, you know, that, uh, that the devil is real, you know, that there is violence in, um, in the world because of sin. Uh, but even that these people, we, my children ask to pray for um, the bad guys <laughs> or the, the people who have who have hurt us like that is part of our our prayers like we pray first you know for security they oftentimes they ask you know that uh, nobody um, nobody hurt them but at the same time they they ask you know that that uh, they be shown Christ or that they that they are forgiven and that's really a neat part of living here it's still hard but it's definitely something that has been a fruit of living here that our children get to experience both sides of that, that yes, we pray for those who hurt us. Yeah, that's a good lesson to learn. What are the educational options in the area? So we, our congregation used to have a preschool. Our, our preschool teachers retired uh, at the end of last year, um, right before, like right around the pandemic, that was going to be our, our final uh, final year uh, with them, but we were, with everything that's happening, we weren't going to um, kind of rush into finding new teachers. Rather, we decided to um, indefinitely close down the preschool until we worked some things out, but they had gone there for, Isaiah was there for two years, and uh, Titus was there as well, and uh, they enjoyed that education, but now with our public schools in the area, we chose, uh, with everything going on, and I would say the breakdown of obviously the government or um, them putting their hands in, in places that we don't like, we have decided to not go to public schools. And so our children right now are enrolled in our local Roman Catholic school. Um, I praise God that they're such good theologians <laughs> because they come home and they're always questioning like, uh, Dad, they said this about uh, such and such. Uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with Mariology, of course. Um, but they are so, so smart and talented. And they, they come back and they say, well, Dad, this is just wrong. I, they can't, I cannot find this in the Bible. Uh, so that's always been cute. But they are, I, I find it, again, more than cute. I, I actually believe it is, is that beautiful fruit of faith that God gives them. Uh, but that's where they're at, and they're getting a great education. The teachers are very sincere and kind there, and I really have no issues with them uh, going there, especially knowing how uh, how bright they are. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about Pennsylvania's response to the cor coronavirus. Is it more like New York and California, that more draconian approach, or more like South Dakota or Florida? All right. So we uh, were blessed and in this way, even though we have a very liberal government, as you uh, may have seen from our health secretary, who is now serving in other places, um, he, you know, while he had many things to say, Governor Wolf did not impose any direct things upon churches or let's just say houses of worship. Um, that proved to be a very uh, 
big asset to us. We never closed down our church. We never shut our doors. We had services every week. At the beginning of the pandemic, uh, before we really fully understood everything, I was holding uh, services for individual families or those who felt comfortable enough uh, gathering together. And then uh, that included in Easter, I think I had 15 services in Easter, uh, on Easter. And then following that, though, um, between talking with my elders and, well, as the leaders in the church, we quickly went back to having services uh, for those who wished to gather. And I always still offered uh, individual devotions and uh, and time with uh but those who chose to, to be more along the lines of the shut-ins or um, uh, waiting for a, a better time to come to church uh, where they felt safe and also obviously working out with their family. Some had, uh, some were caretakers, some were workers in the medical field. And so they had different, different needs that they needed met. But by and large, having the freedom uh, to do that and conduct services as I desired was very important, and it really contributed well. Um, during the time outside of the church aspect of it, uh, one of those nice things about Pennsylvania was, or is for our family, the early er intervention. Um, my youngest daughter has, has Down syndrome, and so she is very much always getting therapists in the house. One of the hardships, though, um, was the state did not allow uh, those workers to come in the home. So we had to do kind of teletherapy, which was just, I mean, it was us working with our daughter, which is fine because, you know, we're all good with that, but uh, it did not, it did not provide the best uh, for our child uh, as well as the boys um, being at the Roman Catholic school, they were able to go in person, but I know some of the old, other local areas, uh, school, public schools, they were all uh, virtual and or went virtual a number of times, which uh, parents have commented, I'm sure, in other areas, but that has had a drastic effect on our kids as well. I see. Let's now talk about happier things. If you had a friend coming into town, what would you say, ah, you got to go check this out? Uh, things to do, places to eat. What would you recommend if somebody was coming into town? Well, um glad you asked that question because – this is pretty cool place to live for a number of reasons. So we have um, a couple fun fun areas in here. So we have what's called Buell Park. It's the hidden gem, we say, of Sharon. Uh, it's kind of a nestled place among a, a higher end location uh, of Sharon. And it's a beautiful uh, green area and park, but you can drive through it. Uh, it also has some of the best playgrounds in the area. One is like a disabled um, uh, playground where uh, accessible, I should say, um, playground so that you can uh, wheel wheelchairs up the ramps and it's all padded, has special swings and everything like that. So we are taking, you know, a step in the right direction in that area. We can make these playgrounds more accessible to children who may have uh, certain disabilities or handicaps. The other uh, positive of that place is uh, there's these huge open fields that you can just run in uh, and enjoy, you know, just flying kites uh, where in many cities, you probably can't do that because they don't have a large enough area. So that's been pretty cool. Um, it's also uh, right next to Buell Park, they have the Buell Park Golf Course, which I've always been told is the only free golf course in the world. So you can go and golf nine holes for free. And they also have a driving range there. So I make use of that. Uh, I just picked up golfing last year. Somebody told me I should. So <laughs> I tried. I, I mean, I'm not very good at it, but I still go. Um, we also have, again, uh, it's called Ryers. It's if I'm not mistaken, one of the, if not the largest um, shoe store also in the country. Uh, so that's a pretty neat place to go. Um, we also have, uh, maybe you've heard of Joy Cone. Uh, they have a, a, they make and manufacture all the cones for ice cream here uh, right near us. So that's kind of a cool place. But yeah, I mean, um, if they were coming into town, those are usually the places that uh, the tourists like to shop. We also have like this um, this old uh, building. It's called the Winter, and they have um, different floors where you can buy. Women like to go there for uh, for shopping for shoes or dresses, prom and weddings and all that other stuff. 
but the best thing in my opinion i'm you know a guy and i love to eat so we got uh you can get your special foods uh like i said there's haitian sensation which i love to go and eat at i just had some lunch there today um they we have uh, nico's hot dogs um some some good chili dogs down there we also uh like i told you we have just different ethnic foods so uh bring you to scato's for some delicious italian pizza um but all those different things i i've really enjoyed um having that as well you know we can go to the different parks in the area national parks are within a few hours uh, a couple hours drive so that's always fun that is really fun as we start to close out the podcast pastor deal i want to make sure to give you the opportunity to point our listeners where you'd like places to follow you online your church's website where would you like to send our listeners Ah, so from our church's website, you can pretty much find all the information about us. It's saints with an S, Peter and Paul dot net. And that's all spelled out. So it's very easy to remember saints, Peter and Paul dot net. Uh, from there, you can listen to sermons. You can find our link to our Facebook and um, also our YouTube page, as well as some of the things that we're doing um, currently. Great. Pastor Deal, thank you so much for your time today. What are your parting thoughts for our listeners? Well, I would tell you, Nicholas, wherever wherever you are, even though you know the situation might seem doom and gloom in your in your area, uh, that it is a special place uh, where you can, you know, bring the seed of of Christ's love and and watch it grow. I mean, our congregation has changed uh, in the last five years that I've been here. It's pretty much all new people, and that's been a beautiful gift, and they've really come uh, from the care that we've shown to the community, uh, and we hope to establish that here. Even We don't, we don't have any intense, uh, intentions of moving. This is where our congregation is, and we have a beautiful, beautiful place to, to work in the ministry that God has given to his church to do here with Word and Sacrament, so... Just a word of encouragement. Thank you. Thank you again. God's peace. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Lutheran Cartographer. For more about the things that we talked about today, check out the show notes page at lutherancartographer.com slash 67. I encourage you to check out that Audible offer. That's at lutherancartographer.com slash audible to go ahead and get a free audiobook with your trial of their service. And until next time, I'm Nicholas Weber. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you soon.